Diagnostic Pearls in Neuroophthalmology. This is a case-based session and hoping to cover most aspects of neuroophthalmology. For the first talk, I invite Dr. M. B. Francis, Chief Consultant at Theresa Eye and Medical Center, Chertala. He is the President-Elect of Headache Society of India and Reviewer for Annals of Indian Association of Neurology and, and Free Paper Evaluator for Neuroophthalmology Section of All India Journal. Over to Francis, sir. His talk is on posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. So, very good morning everyone and thank you Dr. Arun. <laughs> RPLS or PRESS, reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. A rare syndrome but it can be a shocker for any of us on any day. It is not always posterior not always in the parieto-occipital region, it can be anterior also. It is not always reversible. And leukoencephalopathy is white matter dysfunction, not always white, white matter. Gray matter also can get affected. So when do you suspect this syndrome? The predisposing factors. You remember TRAB or TRAP. Basically it is a TRAP. T means transplant, post-transplant patients, any organ transplantation, thrombocytopenic purpura, and tacrol amos like anti-immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, R is renal dysfunction, dialysis or nephritis. A means autoimmune disorders like SLE. And uh, the most important is the B, blood pressure, acute rise in blood pressure. And also remember, uh, P means preeclampsia, eclampsia. You know, the maximum cases, 90% of the cases are peripartum or postpart. Now the symptomatology, how do they present to you? They can present with blurring of vision or scotoma or total blindness. So when they get blurring of vision, it is not the usual blurring that they get. Migraine patients with aura can get blurring and they can get it after delivery also, any time. So it must be a new onset blurring new onset uh, scotoma and a new onset headache. If they get headache in the past, this will be something new. Uh, that they tell you, this is not the usual headache that I get. And the second, next uh, group of symptoms are not for you, seizure and mental state changes. And there are so many other symptoms which may not com come to you. And this is the case, a typical case, 28 year old female, postpartum day two, past history of migraine, but this time she started getting headache, which is a different type. And next day blurring, and by evening she was completely blind, with mild confusion and disorientation, and BP was 190, 110. And clinically, you know, patient blind, doctor blind, something like retrobulbar neuritis, where minimum you get APD and color vision defect, here there is nothing. So whenever you get pupil brisk, immediately focus on to the posterior visual pathway, the occipital lobes and visual cortices. Of course, psychogenic blindness can be an extremely rare differential, but you have to rule out RPLS or infarct first. You may get uh, hypertensive retinopathy changes, grade 1 to grade 4. So you get this symptom in that predisposing uh, stage, you always think of a stroke mimic. And this is the MRI, T2 and flyer. You can see the hypertensity at the occipital lobes, visual cortices. T2 and flyer will show you this hyperdensity. And the classical diagnostic sequence is, you know, diffusion weighting and ADC map. Diffusion weighting on the right, you know, you can see again hyperdensity and ADC map will be hypodense. Usually in infarct it will be hypodense, this will be hyperdense. So once you get that ADC map hypodense, that is, you know, the vasogenic edema formation. That is the time you get this. Otherwise, it will be cytotoxic edema and you get uh, hypodensity. And these are, you know, cases of uh, RPLS with differentials, including bilateral PCA infarcts. So 90% always postpartum. So always remember a postpartum patient. Be very careful about a postpartum patient. And CT is not that inferior. You can get CT also positive in many cases. You can see the bilateral hypodensity in the occipital lobe. 
and DDs can be of uh, any kind like uh, PCA infarct, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, hypoglycemia, posterior progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, demyelination, metabolic. So, you know, if it is not fitting into the right predisposing uh, uh, factors, then you have to investigate it. You have to go for extensive investigation by neurologists and different other physicians and other uh, specialities. And why posterior? Why it is always posterior or 90, 95% posterior? There is something known as autoregulation. So this autoregulation controls the blood flow into the brain. So in the posterior part, parieto occipital area, there are uh, very few sympathetics. So, you know, uh, whenever there is a high spike in blood pressure, this autoregulation fails. And there is vasodilatation and exudation, oozing. That is the mechanism behind. Of course, there are different other mechanisms which are not very important. So, this vasogenic edema will subside if you treat these cases early. That is why awareness, early detection and either treatment or referral. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis, sir, for the beautiful talk. Now I invite Dr. Revati uh, to speak on visual fields. Uh, Madam is the head of neuro-ophthalmology in Tony Fernandez Eye Hospital at Alua. Uh, Madam always gives something new insights uh, in each and every talk. So let's uh, be attentive to her. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matthew, for those kind words. First of all, I would like to thank KSOS and uh, Dr. Uh, Arun, Thomas Arun Argist for giving me this opportunity. Uh, visual fields, uh, all of us are very familiar with the usual visual fields that we see along the pathway. So I thought I will deal with some interesting or unusual fields. Uh, the first case I am presenting is a 52-year-old female patient who came with blurring of vision in the left eye. Somewhere in her left upper temporal quadrant of one week duration, she was an uncontrolled diabetic, no other relevant history. Visual acuity was near normal in both eyes, 6-9 in the left compared to 6-6 in the right. Both eyes, the pupil, color vision, the anterior segment and the fundus examination were all normal. The, when we went on to do the fields, the field showed in the right eye there was a small scotomatous lesion where you can see this, this one. Just a suggestion of a, uh, an appearing uh, scotoma in the right, in the upper temporal quadrant, whereas in the left there is a definite scotoma in the upper temporal which seems to be spilling into the uh, inferior temporal also. So here there was a suspicion of a bitemporal lesion, so we went on to do an MRI, which showed a pituitary macroadenoma. The patient went to the neurosurgeon, got operated. This was her fields uh, immediately post-op. And two months after uh, surgery, her fields were absolutely normal. A similar case, uh, before that, uh, a few learning points from this is that when the patient is complaining of a defective vision but you're seeing 6-6 six, six and 6 vision, the field becomes of paramount. The, if the fields are suggestive but not clear cut, maybe you should be doing a neuroimaging. Another uh, patient who came to us mainly with blurring of vision, six months duration and photophobia. This, no other neurological symptoms. Again, the best corrected visual equity was 6-18 and 6 and all other uh, Findings were normal except for the fields. When we did the fields, we have a temporal bitemporal scotoma, uh, typical bitemporal scotoma. And the, <coughs> the problem turned out to be a supracellar meningioma. These two are somewhat similar cases, but one presented with uh, defective vision, the other presented mainly with photophobia. Then I have an 88-year-old male came to us with a complaint of defective vision both eyes and he was a bilateral pseudofake with visual equity of 612 N6 in the right eye, 69 uh, N6 in the left eye. Field exam, uh, fundus examination showed bilateral temporal disc pallor. Field uh, showed uh, in the right eye a superior and inferior quadrantic uh, defect with a clear wedge in between and in the other eye there was a superior quadrantic defect they, it had not yet progressed. This kind of a defect is very typical of a la, uh, lateral geniculate body lesion, which has a by, uh, dual blood supply. If the anterior choroidal vessel is affected, you get what is called a homonymous quadruple sectornopia. 
with a sparing of wedge. If the posterior choroidal circulation is affected, this is, it is the wedge that becomes a scotoma and the rest of it will be normal. We went on to do an, uh, an MRI and found the LGB lesion, referred the patient to a neurologist. Uh, there is this temporal crescent syndrome, which we read about. I have not seen a patient, so I just have to take a few pictures from the net. Retrochiasmal lesions typically present with contralateral homonymous visual field effects. Temporal crescent syndrome, which occurs from a lesion in the most anterior portion of the occipital cortex, is an exception. Here the patient presents with a monocular loss of crescent-shaped visual field uh, loss in the temporal uh, field, and it is... Uh, mm, contralateral to the lesion uh, as seen uh, here. The lesion is usually in the occipital, most anterior part of the occipital cortex. cortex. The important point here is that the usual uh, Humphreys 30-2 field which we do may not detect this lesion. We need to do a full field analysis. However, a very carefully performed uh, confrontation can demonstrate this lesion. Confrontation is an oft ignored wonderful test which if done very carefully can uh, give us a clue to so many different field problems that we may find in the uh, perimetry. Uh, this the MRI shows where the lesion is in the anterior part of the occipital cortex. Then there are one or two field defects which are a little dear to my heart because uh, uh, patients usually come to us saying that this patient had a stroke and uh, this is the f and he has he or she has uh, defective uh, vision now when a person says a stroke and you see a picture like this uh, you should suspect that the patient has had two events of strokes this is a typical checkerboard pattern. The opposing uh, quadrants are lost, and this is called a checkerboard pattern of field effect. One field, which was a temporal lobe lesion probably, knocked off the superior quadrants in the patient's uh, visual field, and the second subsequent field, unfortunately, knocked off inferior quadrants op opposite to the superior pi. So the final picture you see is a checkerboard and this is because the patient has had two strokes uh, divided in time. This is another example of such a uh, patient having two strokes. One, the uh, stroke produced a typical homonymous hemianopia and the second one produced a homonymous hemianopia with a macular sparing. So finally, all that the patient has is a central D-shaped visual field, uh, which is almost like tunnel vision. This is because the patient has suffered two strokes. Now, coming to the last case that I have to present, a 49-year-old patient presented to me, this was a few years ago. He complained of blurring of vision in right eye of four years duration, known diabetic, no other contributory history. The best corrected vision in the right eye was 618N6, left eye 69N6. Uh, other uh, anterior segment uh, was normal. Fundus showed mild uh, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And I did a field, it was this funny kind of a field which produced, he seemed to have a pathway of, uh, uh, of remaining field in the middle of uh, darkness on either side. We repeated this field several times, but this was exactly the picture that was reproduced. So we did an MRI, then went on to do an MRA. Everything was normal. So I sent this patient to a neurologist and then to a second neurologist and then to one of my friends, an ophthalmologist for uh, opinion, because I was chasing this, what kind of field is this? And the final diagnosis that we came to was that the patient was functional. These are very rare but we do have to keep them in mind. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Devidi. Very interesting field uh, defects that we don't usually see. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Matthew James. Dr. Matthew is a consultant ophthalmologist at Medical Trust Hospital. He did his uh, post-graduation from All Day Institute and has done a lot of, had a lot, lot of publications. He has a, a definite advantage of over a lot of uh, us neuro-ophthalmologists and ophthalmologists. He's married to a neurologist, Dr. Sangeeta. Over to Dr. Matthew. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh, thank, I thank KSOS for giving me this opportunity. 
Uh, I'll be speaking to you on occipital lobe lesions. Occipital lobe lesions have always mesmerized me with the different presentations, the symptoms that it can actually show. So I'll be presenting four cases uh, which shows different, different kinds of symptoms. The first one is a 72-year-old male who presented with headache in the occipital region and a decreased vision on the right side since two weeks. But he had a history of difficulty to approach and grasp objects on his right side since few months. On examination, his vision, uh, he was able to identify the movement of fingers at 6, six meter distance but was unable to read anything on the snellus chart. Otherwise, his eyes were perfectly normal. Visual fields um, was done and he was found to have a right homonymous hemianopia. Im imaging was uh, straight away done because anyway, hemianopia is there. So we found a large occipital lesion which was uh, involving the left occipital cortex, extending to the parietal, temporal and into the splenium basically. So uh, the highlight that I, uh, I would like to give is uh, why, what was the reason for the symptoms? The, the diagnosis was basically a high grade glioma. Now what was the reason for the symptoms? As I told you, he was not able to read anything on the Snellens chart. So he had basically a difficulty in reading that is Alexia. Now why do the patients, such patients show th the symptoms? Just because uh, after an image is actually processed, uh, processed in the occipital lobe, the information has to be given to the language area. As you know, the language area is on the dominant hemisphere that is on the left side. So the left cortex is definitely damaged, so that connections are definitely lost. But usually in a patient, it has an intact other lobe, that is the right occipital cortex, which can actually pass on the information. Now in this patient, the difference was that the lesion was extending to the splenium basically. So those connections were also lost in this patient. And as a result, actually the patient was not able to read anything on the Snellens chart. So that was the reason for the Alexia that he was showing. So in preferably in such patients, actually, if you like to look for a visual acuity, you should use preferential acuity charts like Teller's acuity chart and all those things. Uh, only those can give actually what is the actual visual acuity of the patient. Now, uh, the patient also had difficulty in grasping the objects on the right, right, right hemifield. And that was because like even, even if the patient is not having a visual field defect, uh, even then, if the uh, connections from the visual association area to the motor cortex are affected, the patients can have difficulty in grasping the objects in that hemifield. So this patient was having the difficulty since few months prior to, even before he noticed that he has developed a visual field defect. So that's, these are the two symptoms that I would like to highlight in this case. And the second case is a um, uh, patient who presented with headache and acute, con acute onset colored halos. Here I would like to uh, highlight on the symptom of colored halos. Many a times uh, we uh, sometimes ignore this complaint when the patient says this or sometimes we say that it is a just, just a migraine. Otherwise his eyes were perfectly normal. Just we went for a uh, visual field examination and we found he had a uh, left homonymous hemianopia. Uh, imaging was done uh, and we found that he had an occipital cavernoma in the right, time, uh, right side and also had epileptiform discharges. So uh, the reason here was uh, like the colored halos was due to actually a occipital seizure which was ongoing in that patient since last one week. Uh, if we had missed it, we would have missed the diagnosis and it would, it would have become severe. So as an ophthalmologist, patients, if when, com when the uh, patient comes with colored halos, actually we should give importance to those symptoms. So how do you distinguish between whether it is an, a seizure or a migraine? If it occurs in the same manner every time, right, it will be stereotyping or else if it occurs very rapidly within seconds or else if it is just confined to a hemi field, then always think that there is a possibility of seizure and go ahead with the further investigations. Now the third case is a 77 year old male who presented with giddiness and decreased vision in both, both eyes sudden onset. He already had a history of uh, right hemifield loss due to a uh, left hemifield loss due to a right occipital infarct one year back. He was on treatment. Suddenly he developed the other, eye, other side stroke also. That means he developed a bilateral occipital stroke. You can see in this image one is an old stroke and one is a fresh stroke basically. So he had a bilateral occipital. So in, uh, in fact we know that he will have a macula spared area. So he will have a tunnel vision through which he should be able to read. But this patient. Uh, I tried to do everything but he was not able to read anything through that field and in fact what uh, finally I concluded that he was having a visual agnosia basically. Uh, what happened is that uh, in such patients actually uh, the patient cannot actually uh, have the logic to identify what is the thing. So you give a line diagram or you give a pencil or a stethoscope. He will say that uh, this is a rope, there is something attached on the end but he cannot say that it is a stethoscope uh, or he cannot say that it is a pencil. Uh, but if you give the thing into his hands, suddenly he will say, ah, this is a pencil, this is used to write. So he, when he gets the tactile stimulus, he will, he's able to identify, but otherwise visually he cannot identify. So uh, in such patients actually, uh, we should also think that there are other things other than just uh, measuring the visual acuity. So this was agnosia. 
Now, uh, I would like to end my presentation with uh, one talk that, like, uh, you know the story of Redox syndrome, basically. The Redox, George Redox was actually a, a, a neurologist and he found that uh, after uh, uh, World War I, when the, they used to have helmets, small helmets actually. So, the soldiers used to have injuries in the lo occipital lobe, but these soldiers were actually able to see even through the blind field. So, that is how the Redox syndrome diagnosis came and later on, the pathways were actually diagnosed. So, uh, the question is like, we as ophthalmologists might be able to diagnose new symptoms, new pathways or name it under us. You might, uh, I, uh, some things which I, uh, during the development of this presentation, I came to know about palinopsia. It is something like uh, patient is seeing something which even after the target has gone. Like uh, the patient says that so, such things can happen. Uh, so uh, these symptoms also can be considered as a lesion of occipital co cortex. The prosbacnosy, as you know, then uh, even uh, patients can have actually micropsia, ma metamorphopsia due to the cerebral causes. Actually, we know about retina, macular edema causing micropsia. But even cerebral causes can also cause micropsia and metamorphosia. And the lastly, it can also cause color blindness. That's all. Thank you very much for. Thank you, Dr. Matthew, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I now invite Dr. Thomas Arun Vargis to give, in, give his uh, talk. Dr. Thomas is a glaucoma and a neuro ophthalmology consultant at Dr. Jacobs Eye Hospital, Cochin, Alfonso Eye Hospitals, Pala, and Todibura, uh, St. Joseph's Eye Hospital at Kanyarpalli. Uh, he has 10 years of experience in the UK. He has a best paper uh, from the, at the Welsh Ophthalmic Forum in 2004, best paper in Synapse Neuroophthalmology Conference in 2016. He's a speaker at uh, national and international conferences and a quiz master at state conferences. I invite Dr. Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Revati. I'd like to thank KSOS at the outset for this opportunity. My approach to disc edema, as a, every case should be approached like a case of Sherlock Holmes, and I acknowledge my mentor in neuroophthalmology, Mr. Barr, whom, with whom I worked in UK for six years. So these are 12 different cases of disc edema photos you can see, and the etiologies of all 12 were different. So how can you go about finding out what is the cause of disc edema in your patient? So approach should be with history, examination and investigations. In, in neuroophthalmology and in uveitis branches of ophthalmology, history has quite an important role. So we can ask for additional symptoms and when you come to the examination, you need to differentiate true versus pseudoedema, unilateral versus bilateral, check the optic nerve function, general examination, blood pressure, here I'm checking the superficial temporal artery, feeling for any fullness of the temporal fossa. All this can give you important clues as to the cause of disc edema. And additional ophthalmic features, again I'll, for, I'll uh, explain to you about that. And when necessary, the appropriate investigations. You can use your fingers or you can use this, use this hat pin for doing a quick confrontation visual field. And to check the pupil, you need to have one bright torch and one sort of diffuse illumination torch to, so that you can see the consensual reflex. True versus pseudo disc edema, you can see here on the left, the five C's that I use, the color, the cup, the contour, the circulation, and complete retina. On your left, you have the true disc edema, and the two important C's to differentiate versus pseudo is, one is the cup. The cup is actually lost late in true disc edema, unlike in pseudo, you can see the optic disc drusen and hypermetropia where, there's disc is, where the cup is absent. And M and F, I'm sure none of you will confuse with disc edema. And the second important C is circulation. Again, in pseudoedema, you can see all the blood vessels, the circulation very nicely over the disc, unlike in true edema, where the blood vessels over the disc are blurred. Coming to the site of disc edema and the cause, so if it is unilateral, you're thinking a unilateral cause like a posterior scleritis, optic neuritis, AION neuroretinitis, while if it is bilateral, you're thinking papilledema, ICSOL, hypertension, and a systemic cause. The additional features, this is what I really like you to focus on. The additional features are very important. So, with the, his, coming, when the history ex, additional points are the, uh, pain on extractor movement, you're thinking optic neuritis. Severe pain, the bottom one, you're thinking posterior scleritis. If you're thinking, if there's a pallid disc edema, like I've shown here, it is AION. If the other cranial nerves involved, you're thinking of orbital apex lesion. 
If the retinal exudation, like the photograph I have shown here on the bottom right, you can see this retinal exudation, you are thinking neuroretinitis. If there is choroiditis, or if there's, uh, you're thinking tuberculosis, if there's proptosis, you're thinking an orbital mass. So these additional features, once you've seen the discadema, look for the additional features and that will give you important clues. In the case, again, bilateral with a macular fan, you're thinking raised ICT. This is the case you can see here. This is presented with blurring in the right eye. You can see a discadema and you can see the extensile cotton wool spots and few splinter hemorrhages. So this straight away points to a systemic uh, cause. He had similar finding in the other eye, but no disc edema. And this is a case of systemic hypertension. If there's anterior and posterior segment inflammation, you're thinking a uveitis, maybe a sarcoidosis, VKH. And if it's a bilateral optic neuropathy, you're thinking pituitary craniopharyngioma or a toxic cause. So a few examples here. So 47-year-old female, decreased vision in the left eye for three days. You can see the disc edema on the left eye. Right eye is normal. And all the optic nerve functions were depressed. So thinking presumably a typical optic neuritis and you can see typical optic neuritis behaves in a certain way, worsens for two weeks and starts improving by four weeks and that is exactly what happened in this patient. So this, is a, okay, this diagnosis is only confirmed in retrospect. If it does not behave in that way, you need to think of other causes. Also you need to think of other causes like NMO and MOG but we won't go into that. Again, another patient I saw while in working in the UK, decreased vision in the left eye for three weeks, and you can see there was a fullness of the temporal fossa, the disc edema on the left side, and a CT scan was done. As you know, bony lesions, CT scan gives a much better image, and the, the important clue was that the fullness of the temporal fossa gave the clue as to the cause. A very interesting patient I saw in uh, uh, Kanyanapalli, this is a patient with a uh, 29-year-old with headache and right type pain. You can see the marked disc edema. When, when I examined, there was a doubtful choroidal uh, elevation or a choroidal, uh, you could say, the, um, serous detachment in the infra infranasal quadrant. Left eye was absolutely normal. And because of the marked edema and the exudation, I was thinking of an infective cause. So provisionally started on antibiotics and obviously did the TB investigations which came as positive. And you can see the choroidal abscess which appeared and this gave the clue. And ATT, with ATT, the patient had a very good outcome. So important clue was the choroidal exudation and of course the new lesion. And this is the one I showed you, the macular fan points to a neuroretinitis. Again, optic disc edema, blurring in the left eye and the other eye optic atrophy. So important clue from the other eye, this is a case of pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome that we see more nowadays due to AAON. So optic atrophy on one side, disc edema on the other side. Another lady again I saw and in the UK, 35 year old, on oral contraceptive pill with diarrhea. So this causes a hypercoagulable stage. She came with headache and double vision because of six nerve palsy. And of course, papilledema causing headache. And MRB, all cases of papilledema, MRB should be done. And this showed a superior cytal sinus thrombosis. And with anticoagulation, she made a good recovery. So investigations in all cases of bilateral disc edema, definitely make sure you do MRI and MRB. So take home message. So detailed history, focused examination, true versus pseudo, unilateral versus bilateral, look for additional features, just spend time on that, points sometimes go back to the history, systemic examination, blood pressure, investigations, blood and imaging, and that will give you the diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Thomas Arun, for that wonderful presentation on uh, papilledema. <coughs> Invite Dr. Matthew James again for his talk on cranial neuropathy. I'll be speaking to you on cranial neuropathies and uh, brain stimulations. I'll get into the case straight away. Uh, I'll be take, uh, talking to you about uh, four cases. Two cases will be about brain stimulations, and this, uh, the other two will be on cranial neuropathies. Uh, the first case is 35-year-old male with acute onset visual disturbance. On examination, he had diplopia on looking towards the right, uh, on towards the left side. He had a limited adduction of the right eye during levo version. He had a near normal convergence in the same eye. Diagnosis is very pretty straight. Uh, you can see the clinical pictures. All other eye movements are normal except for the right eye. The adduction has been lost. You can see that highlighted area. So uh, definitely, this is an I N O. Clinically, this is a. Convergence, you can see, I'll show you the convergence. 
the eyes can better converge onto the pen actually when, when the patient sees the pen. So uh, it's a very simple case. Uh, it's an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And uh, you know that when the middle long tail fasciculus is uh, involved with a uh, lesion, uh, the information from the PPRF doesn't go to the opposite middle rectus. And as a result, this symptom is shown. But the thing which I would like to highlight is there are two innervations. One is a pulse innervation and the step innervation. So what we are dealing now in the first case was a pulse innervation. That means uh, the pulse innervation which was sent to the opposite medial rectus and the lateral rectus was not uh, was uh, not possible. It was not being fired, so, and uh, as a result, he developed the INO. Now, what happens? Uh, there is one more center in the pons which actually has to uh, maintain the circuit. One, once you uh, once the brain sends the information, look towards your right side. The right lateral rectus moves. The left medial rectus moves. So uh, after reaching that position, the brain has to maintain that circuit and that is done by another center. Usually we don't get lesions of that, that, that area and it is done by actually nucleus preposterous hypoglossary. So uh, what will happen if that center is involved? That is my second case actually. Uh, this was a 73 year old male who presented to emergency with acute onset weakness and difficulty on looking towards the left side. And he was diagnosed to have an acute left mountain infarct uh, from the casualty itself. His eye movements were perfectly okay. He, he was able to move everywhere. Uh, I didn't find any diplopia or anything. But uh, and this was the imaging. He showed a infarct in the left pons. But uh, actually, when examining his eyes, you can see he is not able to maintain his gaze. He is trying to move his head. Uh, and uh, maintain the fixation towards the left side. He, he uh, initiates the circuit, then again loses it. When he looks to the other side, he is able to do that. So that was, uh, this, is, this is what happens if the, uh, uh, if the um, uh, nucleus, NPH is affected. So he will be able to initiate the circuit, but he will not be able to maintain it. And as a result, he will have disturbance of vision. And the same thing can happen in the vertical gaze also. That is when INC, the internucleus nucleus of Kajal is affected. He, uh, th that also can cause similar kind of symptoms towards the vertical gaze. Now the third case is a 18 year old male. Uh, who presented to the OPD with history of diplopia and headache. He uh, had associated photophobia and migraine. His vision was 6-6, no RAPD. He had a right uh, third nerve, uh, sixth nerve, fourth nerve, all were affected. And, uh, and to in, in addition to that, he had a decreased corneal sensation of the left eye. And the uh, sensation of the face was also found to be decreased. So the possible diagnosis was uh, when, when these many nerves are affected, it has to be either the superior orbital fissure or the anterior cavernous syndrome. And definitely, and the imaging also actually uh, uh, was corroborating to that. You can see a large lesion in the left cavernous sinus, which was causing the, all this problem. The MRI, was co MRI with contrast was done and it showed these lesions. Uh, angiography, and definitely, whenever you have such lesions, uh, always do an angiography to rule out aneurysm also. Uh, the investigations was done, the blood investigations were sent, all were negative. Meanwhile, he was started on steroids and he improved drastically with the steroids. Uh, we had planned a biopsy, but since the patient had improved, he deferred from taking a biopsy. And this is the patient after two weeks post treatment. So you can see his movements have completely improved. So one thing that uh, I, I would like to highlight is always do an MRI, contrast MRI and check for the trigeminal nerve whenever you're having multiple cranial nerve palsy, because it might help you to diagnose whether it is an anterior cavernous syndrome or where the lesion is. Uh, now the fourth case is a similar case itself. The 55 year old male who was referred from periphery as acute LMN facial palsy and exposure keratitis had undergone tarsorophy elsewhere. On examination he was found to have again a right third nerve, sixth nerve and a fourth nerve paresis. He also had facial numbness, absent coronal sensation and in addition to the previous case. It was just like the previous case itself. In addition he had a must masticatory mu muscle weakness which you can just ask him to uh, drop his jaw and check the muscle muscle's weakness. So in this patient you can see the clinical picture he has all the uh, uh, all the seventh, third and sixth inf affected. The fourth I am not sure it is not visible on the photos. On the imaging he had a large lesion on the uh, uh, actually arising from the trigeminal nerve and compressing onto the pons basically. So uh, it was uh, diagnosed to be a METS, uh, later on it was diagnosed to be a METS basically. So the point I would like to highlight is whenever you some uh, like uh, trigeminal nerve is a, uh, I think it should be a basic test which, which we should do to uh, whenever we having multiple cranial nerve palsy because it might help us to diagnose the, localize the lesion actually. So that is the point I would like to highlight it, that thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Now we know why I told that he's got an extra edge.
with a neurologist wife oh, over to dr revathi for the next presentation on cp angle tumor dr revathi good morning again everybody uh, cp angle tumor we have selected uh, this topic as part of the uh, afferent problems the moment we say afferent problems involving an ophthalmologist we immediately think of uh, uh, paralytic lesions uh, mainly the third fourth and uh, sixth now so we thought i'll take a slightly different kind of a problem and discuss it because even these patients do present to us this is a, a patient of 50 51 year old male who came with uh, complaints of headache for past one year this patient came from a remote part of lakshadweep so he didn't have uh, facilities to immediately investigate his headache completely he had been treated with uh, changing glasses for one whole year he did not have any other symptom or any relevant history on examination the best corrected visual acuity was 66 and 6 in both eyes the anterior segment was normal fundus examination showed severe papilledema <coughs> this was the picture extraclamous uh, movements were normal and his fields showed uh, nothing very typical but uh, there was there was a, a lesion in both i mean a scotomata in both the uh, uh, in both the eyes in the right homonymous field so only on the suspicion of a retrochiasmal lesion possibly i ordered an mri because uh, the patient had papilledema uh, the diagnosis was a bit of a surprise because uh, i not suspected this it came uh, as a, a cp angle tumor now cp angle tumor is a most common tumor at this site at the cp angle the different kinds of tumors that uh, occur here are vestibular schwannoma meningioma and epidermoid tumors the diagnosis is usually made on uh, on history physical examination and audiometric and radiological evaluation because the patient many a time has got tinnitus and hearing loss mri is a gold standard high resolution ct is also useful to see whether there is any bone involvement now between in the uh, neuroimaging between the vestibular schwannoma and meningioma actually there is no difference in the mri findings t1 and t2 findings in both are same however a uh, high intense uh, ct scan shows an isodense lesion in uh, uh, in a vestibular schwannoma whereas in a meningioma it shows a hyperdense uh, lesion the differentiating features between a meningioma from uh, vestibular schwannoma include a hyperdense appearance in this uh, non contrast ct then a lack of internal auditory canal erosion a broad dural attachment a cleft of csf between the tumor and the brain parenchyma, uh, parenchyma all these in the mri i mean uh, in the ct and a thickening of dura around the tumor which is called a dural tail sign the usual presentation in these cases are meningiomas present more commonly with headaches a vestibular schwannoma presents with profound hearing loss epidermoids present with non specific uh, cp angle signs and symptoms other common symptoms include unsteadiness a tendency to fall and gait disturbance now let us come to the mood point how are we involved how is then ophthalmology or ophthalmologists important in this scenario the patient may present to us with a papilledema or a six nerve palsy as a false localizing sign and the patient may have nystagmus this nystagmus may be spontaneous or positional nystagmus and a specific kind of nystagmus which we will come to soon the patient may present with a facial palsy with exposure keratitis now nystagmus um, nystagmus and cp angle tumors as i said spontaneous or positional and most often it is directed towards the intact site that is the contralateral contralateral to the lesion as a consequence of vestibular deficit now gaze evoked nystagmus may occur this usually precedes a compression of the brain stem 
Then the other kind of nystagmus which we are, uh, we are at least academically quite familiar with is a Bruns nystagmus, which is a type of nystagmus quite typical of CP angle tumors. This type of uh, nystagmus has two components. It has a coarse component of low frequency, which is seen when the patient looks uh, towards the side of the lesion and a very fine component of high frequency both in primary gaze and when the patient looks away from the side of the tumor. Now, beyond uh, diagnosing these uh, patients, the ophthalmologist really does not have a big role to play. So we referred this patient to a neurosurgeon. The treatment uh, uh, modalities that are available for these patients, one observation, if the tumor is very small, slow growing, and uh, found incidentally maybe, mm -hmm. then they are observed. They may be observed. Radiotherapy and microsurgery are the other modalities that, are, uh, that can be uh, offered to the patients. Thank you. I invite uh, Dr. Thomas uh, again to the stage uh, to speak on pupil anomalies. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Yeah. I'll be talking to you briefly on decoding the pupil. This is something that is uh, sometimes worrying for a lot, of, a lot of us, but we'll go through it systematically. The size of the pupil is, uh, depends on a balance between the ambient light and of course the sympathetic and parasympathetic supply. Physiological anisocoria is seen about up to 15 to 20 percent of people at a difference of one millimeter. But a difference of two millimeter or more is considered significant. So again, as I said, in neuro neuroophthalmology history is very important. Nowadays with these massages and things become very, very popular, we do get cases of Horner's syndrome following very vigorous massaging. So this is, uh, uh, that is what I wanted to highlight here. Any history of whiplash, that is another form of injury, all these can lead to uh, uh, involvement of the pupil. And of course, we ophthalmologists are one, one main culprits in making a cause for large pupil following cataract surgery with pupil stretch, uh, pu uh, eye sphincterotomies, and also PRP. PRP again, as you know, can cause uh, damage to the pupillary sphincter, leading to a larger pupil. Systemic disease, diabetes, thyroid, neurological, any history of malignancy, all these should be asked. And sometimes you can ask for old photographs, as we say as the FAT scan, family album tomogram. And that may give you clues as whether it is a pre-existing condition or long-standing condition. Pupil examination, you should check in the ambient light, you can use the pupil gauge, and the size, the shape, the light reflex, the direct consensual and swinging flashlight test, and then the near reflex. It is very important, you should ask the patient to look in the distance so that they are not looking at your face and you sh your face should not come in the way so that it does not stimulate accommodation. A common exam question people ask, uh, examiners ask is, does afferent pathway cause a anisocoria? And the answer is no. So only an efferent pathway will cause anisocoria. Examination, again of importantly you should check the visual function. Uh, optic nerve uh, function test, acuity, color vision, look for other features, look for any uh, lid involvement, extraocular motility involvement, and also any thyroid, any scars of, on the neck, giving a history of thyroid surgery, and looking for other cranial nerves. So if there's other cranial nerve involvement, it will probably mean that it an, or, or cavernous sinus or orbital apex lesion. Feeling the superficial temporal arteries, feel the neck, in the case as you know, lesions on the chest, in the neck can, uh, can cause uh, involvement of the, of the brachial plexus and leading to changes on the neck and the hands and you should quickly have a run through about this. If the pupils are equal, you are thinking for an optic nerve, uh, always check for the RAPD and if the NS chorea, physiological versus pathological and I will show you a few cases of these. Any case of trauma, even though we think this is a young lad who fell off a two-wheeler and sustained a, a, a an injury to the to the right, just you can see the sutures on the right eyebrow region and unfortunately he also suffered an uh, indirect optic nerve injury. So it is very important to check for this even though there is no direct globe injury, just a, sub, just a subconscious hemorrhage, make sure you check for this and document it. Coming to the large pupil, obviously that, uh, if it is an anisocoria, you are thinking of an efferent pathway lesion, 
It can be the, the abnormal pupil, maybe the large one or the small one. So large one, you're thinking third nerve palsy, adystonic pupil, trauma, and I'll show you some examples of these. And small one, typically, usually what commonly that we see is the Horner syndrome. Argan Robertson pupil may, can be large, can be small. And again, as I said, uveitis causing with posterior sinus can be, and we can, ophthalmologists have a best position with the slit lamp to identify these. So physiologic, as I said, but importantly, in physiologic and asocuria, all reactions will be normal and there will be no, no problem with the lids, extraocular muscles, a quick cranial nerve examination, or finally it is a diagnosis of exclusion. This is the usual chart that we see in the books. You will see the patient in, with an asocuria, patient in three different illumination settings, which sometimes not always practical, sometimes difficult to do. The usual flow chart I use is this. So I'm going to show you some examples of this. So basically you have a small pupil and a large pupil and you check the uh, light reaction. And if the reactions are normal, assume that it is the small pupil which is abnormal and look for other features of Horner syndrome. So this uh, karate master I saw in UK suffered a karate chop to his neck and he presented with the ptosis. And also obviously when we examined him, he also had a meiosis as well. And a CT scan showed a carotid dissection. And uh, with the course of aspirin, actually, he, he made a good recovery. So history of trauma, and as I said, if a good uh, the, the, in Hounas, again, the pupil reactions will be normal to light, but you you obviously you have the other features of Hounas syndrome. An approach to NSA Korea. This again was an unfortunate lady. She actually had a cataract surgery in the left eye. She came for a post-op checkup, and uh, as you can see here, uh, here you see the features of third nerve palsy. You can see the bruise on the right side. And uh, she also had a uh, pupil involving third nerve palsy. You can see the larger pupil on the right side. And uh, again, she made a good recovery in a few months' time. Another very interesting case, again, a large pupil, a 40-year-old lady. You can see no ptosis, no oculomotility problem. And you look on the slit lamp. You can see the pupil larger on the left side. If you please watch where the arrow is. This is taken with my mobile phone. And you can see, you can appreciate the beautiful vermiform movements which were seen, and this indicates an AD's pupil. So ideally these patients no, don't need further investigations, but of course in this day of litigation and if the family is worried, obviously you can go for imaging. She, had, she went all the way up, up to Sri Chitra and all, all MRI, DSA, everything was normal. Last patient, again I saw in the UK, third nerve palsy, and he was gradually recovering. You can see the lid is opening up slightly. And if, if this, I've shown him, asked him to look to his right side, and you can see there is a lid retraction and a meiosis. So this is sometimes what people call as a pseudo Argyle Robertson pupil, and it's an oculomotor synchinesis. So take home message, pupil examination can be an integ integral part of your examination, and your stepwise method, both history and examination, will give you clues. And as I said, history gives very important clues to the possible etiology. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for that uh, beautiful talk. Uh, too many uh, beautiful pics, and the video of the pupil with the wriggly uh, iris was very beautiful. Uh, now I invite Dr. Francis uh, to speak on nystagmus. Over to you, sir. So, good morning again. Uh, the classical symptoms of nystagmus. What textbooks tell you? Jumbi vision, shaky vision, vibratory vision, and dancing eyes. Generally, you do not get these symptoms from a patient. What they tell you is blurring of vision, haziness or diplopia. So when do you suspect nystagmus? Anticipating nystagmus. Any new onset, recent onset, CNS symptom. You must be careful. It can be headache, dizziness, vertigo, nausea, vomiting, imbalance, tinnitus, hearing impairment and sensory changes. Any symptom, recent onset or new onset. And most worrisome is always central nystagmus and the most challenging and the commonest is always gaze evoked or side beat vertical or horizontal so when they come to you after maybe two days three days they never come to you on day one 
when they come to you on you know usually i get it third day fourth day fifth day they will be in the compensatory phase so the classical diagnostic signs may not be present like uh, unidirectional and bidirectional <laughs> okay uh, we made it straight when we uploaded huh? it has come again like that oh no okay okay you can see now primary gaze no nystagmus the moment she So primary gaze, no nystagmus. The moment she gazes to left, she is getting jerk nystagmus, oscillations. And if you look at the other side, abduction is absent. So this is opposite of INO. In INO you get adduction absent, abduction nystagmus. So this is exactly opposite and this is reverse INO or posterior INO. And in fact, she is 64 year old, diabetic hypertensive and uh, presented with sudden onset headache and dizziness. They are all red flags. But diplopia 10 days later, that is the time she came to me. So this is double ominous, gaze evoked nystagmus and abduction limitation. So ideally you, you must go for an MRI, but some of these patients in my region, they just cannot afford MRI, went for a CT and you can see the cerebellar infarct there. Oh. So you can see on the other side that inferior part is in fact of the cerebellar hemisphere. Now the second possibility is you no know, two separate events. One after 10 days. The second event after 10 days of the first event. So maybe a cerebellar infarct causing that gaze evoked half jerk nystagmus because cerebellar infarct can present with acute onset headache, acute onset dizziness. So that is what you have to be careful. That is what I always say, any acute onset, any recent onset, you must be careful about a brain lesion. So there was 10 days difference between the first episode and the second episode. So, you know, it could be cerebellar infarct for that right nystagmus and for left abduction deficit, it is microvascular or ischemic uh, sixth nerve paresis. Now the differentials are always very tricky. The most important is peripheral vestibular nystagmus. So that can also mimic a cerebellar infarct. So that is why you look into ear symptoms like ear discharge, hearing loss, tinnitus or any inflammatory symptoms or viral fever, upper respiratory infection. And they usually get primary position jerks, not like central nystagmus. Primary position, if you look carefully, you can see jerks beating to one side and if you occlude one eye nystagmus increases that is classical of a peripheral benign nystagmus and uh, normal saccades and pursuits and rapid shift in head position will exacerbate these symptoms whatever symptoms they have they have severe imbalance like a central lesion but no ataxia so always go for ataxia limb ataxia finger nose and dish diadocokinesis and of course you must look for brainstem signs uh, like uh, skew deviation, Horner syndrome and sensory changes. And most benign too can be gaze evoked like physiological nystagmus or endpoint nystagmus. But that is at the extremes of gaze and they only beat three, four times and they fatigue out. So it is, you know, it is not there when you try for a second time. So it is not a problem differentiating from central gaze evoked nystagmus. And Sometimes you think that abduction is more than adduction. That is also possible. Then nystagmus of extraocular muscle dysfunction on the other side. You know, one, whenever you get that, 
remember myasthenia gravis and internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And you can also get spasmus newtans. You know spasmus newtans, it is horizontal jerk. But one eye, it will be very subtle, very minimal. You may not be able to appreciate. And head nodding and tortic always may not be there. So you may think it is monocular. Usually it is a benign thing. And superior oblique myocamia. It is a saccadic dysfunction, but it is downward endotional saccades in one eye. So whenever you get, you know, monocular nystagmus-like uh, presentation, think of superior oblique myocamia. And monocular pendular nystagmus, more of vertical, where you have to roll out anterior visual pathway lesion, pituitary adenoma or craniopharyngioma. But, but of course, amblyopia can also be a differential. But before MRI, beware of medications. Carbamazepine, lithium and phenantoin and metabolic dysfunction, thiamine, cyanocobalamin and magnesium. So that also must be kept in mind before you send the patient for scanning. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions to the speakers? So Dr. Mike, Francis. Yeah, Dr. Nina. Dr. Francis, so you showed that video in which there was an abduction limitation and uh, no, there was an abduction limitation and nystagmus of the adducting eye. Yeah, adducting eye, nystagmus. Yeah. Abducting and eye abducting, is uh, limitation. Yeah. So could that be a, an early nuclear 6 nerve palsy? Uh, because uh, in nuclear 6 nerve palsy also you will get not just abduction limitation but the abduction, adduction of the contralateral eye will also go because the uh, the MLF connection is also not going, no? Okay, yeah. And also, could it be uh, myasthenia? That is myasthenia also a is a possibility, yeah. yeah. Myasthenia always a possibility. But then we have this cerebellar infarct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to rule out And it. same side only, abduction. Yeah. So that is what you commonly get. Yeah. Sixth nerve, you know, paresis yeah. with... Uh, microvascular ischemic etiology. Okay. And I've also seen in uh, patients with 6 nerve palsy, yeah. sometimes you get this contralateral uh, medial rectus, you know, because it's trying to look, uh, you get sometimes this uh, nystagmus kind of feature, but it's just trying to overact, I think, uh, because that effort of innervation is going. The patient is trying to look to that side. You get this kind of nystagmus-like uh, movement, may not okay. be nystagmus. Nishak movement. Yeah, but I think yeah, you, yeah. what you said, all the other things should be ruled out. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I have presented this in many neuro neurology forums. Yeah. So these are the two differentials. Yeah. One is. Uh, what I wanted to say is that a nucleus 6 nerve can produce a, a you know, a problem with the adduction of the other eye also, not just the abduction, because okay. that MLF connection is not going. Okay, but then you have to correlate with uh, yeah. cerebellar infarct. So, cerebellar infarct is there, so I think, yeah, but ideally you must go for MRI, MRI and contrast yeah. MRI and look for a lesion in the, yes. you know, pons, midbrain, MLF, PPR. One more point. But generally you don't get that. You don't get this. Generally, yeah. Uh, it's all uh, differential. <laughs> so, you can just debate and, you know, you, it is all differential. You can just debate it, yeah. Uh, just one point there. Nuclear sixth nerve will have facial nerve involvement along with this with it because of the presence of the colliculus. So the presence have, of, a, of a facial along with the lateral rectus palsy immediately you think of a nucleus. Yeah, not always nerve. but yes a high index of uh, <coughs> suspicion if you have a facial nerve also. Another point I would like to make is any, any uh, uh, nerve palsy with a, with a uh, paralytic uh, um, deviation uh, in seen in the early f phase will produce can produce a small nystagmoid jerk in the uh, antagonistic muscle that is if there is an abduction de uh, deficit adduction can produce a small nystagmoid jerk in the early phases simply because of the herring's law the other muscle overacts and so to keep uh, foveation of the object of regard, you get this. Uh, there it opens, it uh, overshoots because of the Herring's law, and then it comes back to position in order to keep the object of regard to foveate the object of regard. And because of that, it produces a small nystagmoid movement, which can be uh, interpreted as uh, nystagmus. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you all for attending.